So let's start by first understanding what the steps of lawfulization are and why we would do them. Basics for lawfulization is that we would need something lawfulized if we need to extend its shelf life. For example, if it's not stable in solution. Lawfulization allows us to remove ice or water from a product without destroying our, our volatile molecules. We're not necessarily volatile, but those that might be susceptible to high heat. So these products are placed in a lawfulizer, cooled and frozen, and then a vacuum is established to remove ice as sublimation. So those steps will include first filling the vials with solution, and then taking those vials, placing them into a lawfulizer, and then cooling the vials down to, let's say, around minus 40 degrees C. That step is the freezing step. Cool the vials, allow them to com uh, completely freeze at minus 40, for let's say about two hours, and then we can now initiate a vacuum. That vacuum might be, let's say, around 100 millitor. And then depending upon the properties of the, the frozen solution, meaning those thermal characteristic properties, we may be able to increase the shelf temperature to somewhere around, let's say, minus 20 or even higher and while pull, continuing to pull that vacuum. That stage is primary drying. That's where we're removing the bulk ice. After we remove all of the bulk ice, it is now safe to increase the temperature of the product. It's safe because all of that frozen water has been removed. Now we need to increase the, the temperature of the product to drive off the unfrozen water. That section is known as secondary drying. There's also a step that may be used during the freezing step. That step is known as annealing. That's where, if a product may crystallize, we can encourage crystallization by increasing the temperature of the product and then allowing it to rest without pulling a vacuum. That step is known as annealing. That annealing time allows time for molecular movement, which can encourage crystallization of a crystallizing component or even encourage growth of ice crystals. So our goal is then to fill vials, and here's an example of a filled vial. Our goal is to, after freeze drying, to maintain the same height and volume of the solution that was filled. So as an example of a freeze dried product with an acceptable appearance, that's what we hope to do. What we hope not to do is produce something like this. This is collapse. This occurs if, for instance, we don't understand the thermal behavior of our, of our product and we exceed critical temperatures during primary drying. So that's what we want to avoid. Something else that you may have noticed is that unlike a solution formulation, this formulation has a stopper that is partially seated. And you'll see that this stopper has a single vent. That single vent allows for the escape of water vapor during the process. So before we move on, let's first understand a little bit about the lawfulizer itself. I'm going to bring you a little bit closer to the lawfulizer. This is a laboratory scale lawfulizer. You'll see it has a door with a, another chamber on the front. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Inside, this is the product chamber. There are three shelves to a product chamber for ease of demonstration during this video, I've raised the top two shelves so we have plenty of room. If we look a little farther down, 
we see the condenser. The condenser is where ice, as ice is removed as water vapor during the sublimation, it's trapped on these, con on these coils in the condenser. These coils are kept at around a temperature of around minus 65, minus 70, somewhere around there. So let me raise this camera a little bit. So how does that water vapor get from the chamber down to the condenser? This is an important thing to remember. Not all lockwisers are created the same. These lockwisers have what's known as a spool piece in between the product chamber and the condenser. That spool piece is like a neck. I'll rotate you around to another lockwiser that I have with the side panel removed. What we see here, we see a little bit this neck piece right here between the chamber and the condenser. That is the spool piece. That's important to remember because some lockalizers do not come with a spool piece. They may just have this product chamber and right next to that product chamber where the shelves are placed is the condenser, meaning very cold coils. Those coils can influence the temperature of your product. It's neither good or bad, but it's something to be aware of when developing your process and transferring it. Other lockalizers still may not have a neck, but just this wall in between the, con the chamber and the condenser with a plate that raises and falls depending on the stage of the process. So something else that we need to discuss is how do we cool these vials? Where does this cold temperature come from? Well, these shelves are hollow. They have a cooling fluid that, or heat transfer fluid that rotates or flows through them. Something else that is different between different lockalizers is how that fluid flows. So on some shelves, it flows in a serpentine pattern and down. Other shelves that will flow in a spiral pattern. This is a bit exaggerated, I'm a terrible drawer, but it's a spiral pattern. Why do we care? Well, we care because that definitely will determine how our heat is distributed on that shelf. Neither one has an advantage or disadvantage, it's just we need to be aware of that because there's something what's, that's known as the edge effect in, on a shelf. So when we have a full shelf full of vials, the vials in the inside part of the shelf, the inner portion, will be much cooler than those that are on the very edge. That What comes to an effect is the wall temperature, the door temperature, and how wide these channels are and how well they cover that entire shelf. So that's something we need to be aware of. When we fill vials, they are filled onto a tray, and, and here this is a manual operation in our lab. We have vials filled onto a tray, all stoppers are partially seated, and then you'll notice a bunch of wires here. These wires lead to vials that are equipped with thermal couples so that we can monitor the temperature of our product during the process. Here is a vial with a thermal couple placed inside it. What we try to do is, since these thermal couples are point sensors, we try to align that point as closest as we can in the center of the vial and the center bottom. We do that because as ice is removed, it's moved from the top down. So the bottom is going to be the coldest. That can provide us a measure of when our uh, primary drying cycle is complete. It's not the best way to measure, but it is a possible measurement. It's also a way to uh, determine how close we are to that failure point temperature for our product. And you'll notice that I have a thermocouple placed in the front, middle, and center. Different people play some different methods. Uh, cold, coldest area is going to be in the center, 
edge areas will tell you how warm it might be, the warmest temperature you might experience during the process. So how do we place these in the lyophilizer? We have these on a tray. The tray has a ring around it. And so we'll place it in the lyophilizer and slide this top portion forward as we push. So now the bottom of this tray and the vial is making direct contact with the shell. We can then plug our thermocouples into the different ports. This allows us to, again, monitor our product temperature throughout the process. There are other types of thermocouples that we need to be aware of for temperature monitoring systems. We won't go into all the details here, but there's an RGD, there's a thermocouple that we place directly into the vial, and then there's also these wireless temperature sensors. This one happens to be from Tempris. And you'll see that it has a large glass, not really that large, but a, a glass bottom to it. That bottom contains a crystal that vibrates. And that vibration or oscillation will directly translate into the temperature of our product. And one reason why we like these wireless sensors is that they can be steam sterilized, so they could be used in our production process. And then we also don't have all these wires. So one challenge of placing thermocouples and vials in a manufacturing area is that we can uh, negatively affect sterility assurance. So in a production area, we may only be able to test or monitor the vials that are closest to the front of the door so we don't reach over and negatively affect sterility assurance. These wireless thermocouples allow us to place vials and with temperature sensors along the line and they can be randomly placed on an entire shelf. So after we plug these thermocouples in, we can then close the door. Close the door to the chamber, uh, the condenser chamber, and then start our process. Remembering first portion of it is freezing, followed by primary drying and secondary drying. Things that we monitor during the process. Primary drying. Primary drying, we want to determine when the end is. And that end is determined by one when we completely remove ice from our, our vials and the temperature of our product becomes similar to the temperature of our shelf. Another method and probably a more dependable method, I say more dependable because this method represents what's going on across the entire, entire shelf or across the entire shelves. And that is uh, comparative pressure measurement. Within this lyophilizer, there's a capacitance manometer for measuring the set point pressure. For example, if we set it at 100 millitor, it will show that it's at 100 millitor. Another uh, measurement of pressure is a resistance pressure measurement, known as a Pirani gauge. This electrical resistance is affected by the level of water vapor in the chamber. So when water vapor is high, the pressure recorded by the Pirani gauge is much higher than the pressure recorded by the capacitance manometer. So this provides us a measure of when all the water vapor is removed from our product chamber. At that point, the Pirani gauge measurement will become very similar to the capacitance manometer measurement. That tells us we can now proceed to secondary drying. So there's two little steps here that I'd like to touch on, and that is when we remove water vapor, what else goes into the chamber to balance that pressure? Well, continually throughout this process, there's a nitrogen bleed. So a flow of a small amount of nitrogen into the chamber that replaces the water vapor that's removed. So that means that when these vials are finally sealed, they're sealed under an environment of nitrogen. The 
next portion that I'd like to touch on is what is this? What is this box there? Well, there's something that we need to know during our process, and that is what's the final residual moisture of our product? And we start looking at that towards the end of primary drying and then into secondary drying because we want to be able to take samples during those steps that will represent the high level of residual moisture, medium, and low. Then we take those samples, place them on stability, and examine the effect of residual moisture. That tells us how low we need to go. Then, once we know the, the level of residual moisture we need, we now need to know at what shelf temperature, how long do we need to hold it at that shelf temperature to reach our desired level of residual moisture. So we do all that by taking samples from the chamber. And we want to do that without completely breaking the vacuum. One method of doing that is this thief sample. So this thief sampler has a door on the front. We can seal it into place. And there's a door in the back that goes directly to the chamber. We can then pull a vacuum on this external box until we can open the inside door. When we do that, we now have access to the internal part of the chamber. We can then reach this arm. It may be difficult to see, but there's a a little grabbing device on the end of the arm, we could reach in there, pull a sample, pull it out, seal it, and then have a sample captured at that point of the process representing the certain residual moisture. So we'll close that. At the end of the process, it's your choice now to whether you want to seal under vacuum or not. Sealing under vacuum means that we make sure that there's still a vacuum in there when we compress our shelves to seal the stoppers. So that's how the stoppers are sealed. The shelf is raised using your button until the vials make contact with the shelf above and they're pressed to seal, seal the stoppers. Now there's also one other item I'd like to touch on, and that is what really is the driving force for removing that water vapor? It's a common misconception that it's the vacuum that pulls it out of the vials. That's really not how it works. What we're doing during primary drying is adjusting the pressure in the chamber and the shelf temperature to obtain our desired product temperature. By doing that, we're establishing a pressure difference between there and the chamber, and also a temperature difference. So that pressure difference, the vapor pressure of ice on the chamber is very low. So we have a very low chamber pressure. Here, we have a very much higher temperature to help uh, increase the rate of sublimation. When that occurs, there's now a pressure differential. The vapor pressure of ice is much higher here. So we're removing water vapor, and now it's being trapped at the very low pressure area, low temperature, trapped there on the coils of the condenser. So that's your introduction to lyophilization and your introduction to the anatomy of a lyophilizer.